Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special virtual store tours. Uh, I'm Alicia Esposito, and I'm thrilled to have Ethan Frame of Cuts Clothing and Melissa Gonzalez of the Lion S Group joining me for this chat. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time. Sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I think we have a lot to go through. I think a little bit of, you know, the Cuts Clothing brand story, the partnership between your two firms, and and even some trends around what's happening in brick and mortar, because there is a lot happening. Um, so let's dig right in. First, Ethan, um, let, let's get into the backstory of Cuts Clothing a little bit, because it's a very fascinating brand, really strong positioning. Um, you guys have been around since about 2016, and kind of acquired a bit of a cult following. I know uh, from what I've gathered in my research, people who have made the transition to cuts find it really hard to go elsewhere. So if you were to kind of paint a 5,000 foot view of the brand and, and what makes it what makes it stand out, I mean, what, what would that picture be? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess to say, to start and tell you the 5,000 foot view would kind of have to back up a little bit and tell you the story and how the brand got started really quickly because that kind of shed some light on why we have such a devout following. But a good friend of mine and our founder, Stephen Brelli, uh, we were actually roommates at the time. Um, he was he had just got a job at a marketing agency. We were both out of college and he found that the normal work attire was, it had shifted. It was no longer necessary to do business casual, especially in a place like San Diego where we were living. Um, you didn't need a button down shirt. You didn't need slacks. You know, this wasn't Wall Street or even just like some government agency. Um, it was San Diego, it was laid back. So a lot of people were wearing like, nice jeans, decent shoes, and you know, a quality t-shirt. But he found that even those quality t-shirts, one, were hard to come by. Like for example, you'd go into Nordstrom, find one you loved, and then next season you go there and it's gone. Or they just weren't quite, the properties of the shirts didn't quite fit what he was looking for. Something that was, had a nice premium looking fabric, like really soft, almost kind of like a performance for the office, if you will, like something that you know you could take you throughout your day. Um, it was wrinkle resistant, or at least something that would be wrinkle resistant, didn't have, you know, loud logos or any excessive branding on it. Um, they were out there, but they weren't necessarily something that you could quickly come by. And after speaking to a handful of guys, especially the people he worked with, he found that, you know, people didn't really have like, oh, I usually always go to here. Um, he often got an answer that Lululemon, like they have a five-year T, um, was one of people's like options. But to him, it still looked a little too flowy. It looked a little too on that athletic, athleisure side not as much for the business uh, setting, or at least like a night out, date night, what have you. So then burst the idea of cuts. And um, for quite some time, he was like, you know, putting in the work behind it, you know, uh, launching a Kickstarter, which is what launched in 2016, the, our website went live in 2017, with the sole purpose of developing a shirt that a guy could count on. Um, it wasn't going to go anywhere, you could go there year after year and find great colors, uh, it would have this amazing material, which he ended up developing his own proprietary uh, material called Pika Pro, which is the tri blend of cotton, polyester, and spandex. And so, once people started putting the shirts on, they were like, "Oh my gosh, this, I don't want to take this off. This is the best thing I've ever worn." And I think that speaks to the whole homage that if you have a good product, you're going to have a good fan base and a good community. And so that's kind of really how our grassroots approach got started was just by making a really, really good shirt and solving a problem that a lot of guys had they didn't necessarily outwardly know they had. Right? It was just the struggle of trying to go find a shirt for the office, but. Uh, you know, then we took it a next step and allowed guys to customize it. There used to be just like the crew neck option, but he was like, all right, the same exact body, the same base, but we're going to offer a crew neck, V neck and Henley. And then same with the bottom hems. I'm kind of getting a little bit into the history, but we also offer three different bottom hems. Instead of just the straight bottom, we offer a curve hem an elongated and a split. So really just giving the guys the power of choice when it comes to such a simple item, you wouldn't think about innovating on a t-shirt was really profound. You know, when you say like, oh, I'm, I'm launching a t-shirt company, people are like, Okay, you know, sure, right? But if you really kind of dive into the details a little bit more, it's like, wow, this really was a void in the market. There was white space there that we took advantage of. And uh, we continue to brand ourselves kind of in that trajectory. So I would say it's definitely just taking that simple idea, that simple problem that people didn't know they had, and finding a solution for it that a lot of people have latched onto. Yeah, I love that. And I love that this brand mission or this brand story is really built around a great product, right? Like you can't build a great brand without a great product. But of course, after you have that foundation in place, you have to figure out how do we communicate totally. that brand across all channels? What does that look like from an experience standpoint as you go from e-commerce to social media to other channels? And obviously, um, Ethan, you're the director of brand and special projects. So 
would love your take on what that methodology looks like and, and how you apply storytelling to, to help it all come to life. Sure. So a few ways to answer that. Our initial mission essentially was to just provide guys with an incredible t-shirt wearing experience, right? Um, but as the company grows, as our brand grows up, it needs something a little bit more than just tied to a physical product. So something that we've been working really hard on, honestly, for the past six to eight months, it was like dialing in what that communication was. And we took a step back, looked at like the 10,000 foot view of what we were doing as a brand and what our channels represented. And to answer your question related to that, Instagram was, has been huge for us because Instagram is like the number one place that you can give someone a visual representation of your brand in a matter of seconds. You know, I'm sure you're all familiar with seeing a brand tag in someone's photo, you click it. And honestly, within that first few seconds that you look at their feed, you have that impression of kind of like what you perceive the brand to be. So content cannot be understated. And I think our ability to take content, shirt sure, exactly, and kind of show off the premium nature of it. I mean, our shirts don't run on the, on the, the inexpensive end. I mean, it starts at $48 for one shirt. So if there, there is some sort of convincing that has to be done is like, why is, you know, what makes our shirt better than the others? And we realized that very early on content can communicate that. So we kind of took an approach where we combined a little bit, took a little bit from high fashion and how they do their photo shoots, how they um, show off their product, you know, the crisp, clean lines and pared it down with something as, as simple as a shirt. And doing so has allowed us to communicate our brand and our messaging and, and whatnot. And so what I mentioned we were working on for the past six to eight months is kind of like, what is that evolved brand statement? What are we trying to be? And we took a look at how we are internally as a company. We're all very ambitious go-getters. Um, we, we're, we're up early and we're, we're, we're up late, and not to an excessive extent, but to a point where it's like, we know what we were going after and we know what we want and we're going to get it. So after a handful of, actually more like countless meetings about it, we, we landed on a statement that we feel really summarizes that our brand is that we exist to outfit the world's most ambitious people. So ambition has been huge for us. You know, we've gotten our shirts on tons of NBA athletes, professional athletes, almost across every single sport, actors, actresses, musicians, you name it, entrepreneurs. And really what it comes down to, again, is that product. We have an, an incredible product that they all know and love. And it communicates what we are as a brand internally and, and what we think our customers are, are striving to be. You know, they want to they better themselves. They want to you know, do good things at work professionally in their career, in their home life. And I think some of our imagery kind of just shows that well put together man or gentleman, if you will, who, you know, knows he wants to look good, doesn't need to, you know, dress to the nines necessarily all the time, but by wearing this shirt, he feels confident, he feels ready to attack the day. So ambition really felt like that word that summarizes our customer. Um, and I think, you know, through all of our channels, through our YouTube latest YouTube series, we're doing called always on. We're profiling people that are excelling in their fields. We did it with a race car driver. We did it with a legendary uh, baseball Yankees pitcher named Mariano Rivera. So, you know, ambition and, you know, tying a shirt to, to those types of folks is kind of where we're going with the brand and realizing, you know, we don't want to just be like, oh, that's a comfortable shirt. We want to be known as like, you know, the outfitters of the world's most ambitious people. I love that. And I think it, it's probably very easy, you know, for the head of uh, an apparel brand to fall into the trap of just looking at the product alone. But you have really right. developed this like ethos around the brand sure. and what you are hoping to represent and that that really applies into storytelling. And I love that you emphasize the importance of content, um, which I think is such mm -hmm. a um, critical point in this day and age, especially as you know, consumers rely more than ever on digital and, and creating that consistency because you guys are officially now in, in brick and mortar, hence yes, we why we're doing this store tours conversation today. Um, very exciting. Want to ask, um, what, what made you collectively as a team decide that now was the right time to go into brick and mortar and, and most of all, um, you know, do this partnership and, and get that presence at, at periodic. Well, I think most people looked at us and they're like, you're doing a retail store right now in the middle of COVID. Right. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, yeah. Um, outside of just the simple, or I guess the fun answer of us saying like, we always want to push the envelope. We always want to do what other people aren't doing. I mean, there's an element of that in it. But quite frankly, we with with periodics offerings, we we couldn't turn down um, the opportunity. I think you know we're still a small team over here. We actually hired considerably in the past year. We were at probably seven people, and now we're almost up to twenty. And doing that all remote has been its own challenge. Um, but I think 
because of that small team, we don't necessarily have a, an events or retail planning position. Um, we do have someone that works on wholesale and sales, but when it comes to like actually setting up a physical storefront, you know, I soon learned because I was the one like heading up this initiative that it's a lot of work. And with the amount of help we had with Periodic, I can't even imagine what it would be like if we tried to do it on our own. So to answer your question about why we decided to do it now, I think it was just kind of an aligning of the stars, right? It was so many good things that went along with it. We saw the opportunity that Periodic had to offer and all the, the, the amazing partners that they brought into the mix. Um, it was in Seattle, which I can touch on a little bit, but it's also a very big market for us. It's also where our founder, Steven, and a couple other guys on the team, they're from Wenatchee, which is a little bit east of Seattle. So it's a very big market for us. It felt like home. It felt like a great opportunity, kind of like, hey, let's just test this retail thing. You know, like let's, it's something we, we've had on our docket. It just kind of got gotten pushed down the list. Um, but with this, you know, opportunity and with what Periodic was, it was able to bring to the table, we couldn't turn it down. Yeah. And I just really love the the thought and intention behind Periodic, uh, Melissa, which I, I want to get your perspective because, you know, obviously Ethan's looking at this through the lens of cuts individually, but you have um, really really worked on forging relationships with companies like cuts across different verticals and you have this really strong mission of creating this turnkey and, and achievable model for for going into brick and mortar so would, would love your take on you know the the mission behind this initiative and possibly even how it's evolved right because um even in the past six months alone we've seen such a significant shift in you know how brick and mortar is perceived how pop-ups in and of themselves are perceived new opportunities so i mean what 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 how are you looking at the state of brick and mortar right now? And, and I guess the mission of, of periodic on its own. Sure. I mean, you saw a lot of pivots, obviously, because of COVID and a lot moved to digital. But I think it also reconfirmed the, um, the human desire for in-person connection. And there's a lot about uh, the brand's essence, fit. There's so many elements that are hard to truly compensate for in an online environment. You know, I think what's exciting is you're seeing more unity across all channels and you're seeing a more holistic approach by brand. Um, but understanding that it's such an important touch point. I mean, pre-pandemic, we were working with a lot of um, D2C or digitally native brands coming to brick and mortar because they were hitting $10 million in sales. And it was at this threshold where competing online only became extremely competitive and expensive. And so we would open brick and mortar stores with them and it became pop up as a prototype. So really testing the viability of long-term tenancies, whether it's this is the right market, is this the right square footage, is this the right layout? What do we see in terms of the halo effect, uh, You know, growth to online traffic in a certain zip code radius, average order value, um, less returns, more frequent revisits to, a, to the brand once this became a hybrid shopper. So you know, understanding through all these years the impact that physical could have, we wanted to create a platform that removed a lot of the friction, heavy lifting, CapEx investments that had to go into dipping your toes into maybe your first physical brick and mortar or maybe your first in this city. Um, and the ultimate goal is to help prove that success and also give something great to the community. You know, it's a point of discovery for everybody that lives there as well. We've had a lot of exciting brands since we launched in the summer of last year, in the middle of COVID, but time after time, as we open doors, we see continuous evidence that people want this. You know, we started with Van Moof, with the electric bike company, who now has a permanent space in the area. Um, you know, they started strong out of the gate with people booking appointments and wanting to purchase that. We did one in partnership with the Amazon Horticulture Group to uh, benefit the local zoo. We had a three-week pop-up. It sold out of appointment. Um, slots in 36 hours and then cuts you know they launch with tremendous success and you know again it helps when you have a local presence and the founding teams from there and you know people are excited again for that human side of it too it's a brand that you might have coveted online but now i can be with them in person you know and i can touch and feel and so we wanted to give that opportunity to brands again removing the friction removing that cop capex and really giving it as a validation point of saying okay this makes sense for me and maybe this is a market where i need to be in 12 months a year and now i have those proof points for it and i have learnings too you know it's like 
you approach physical retail with one mindset till you open doors and then you're there and you're learning, okay, maybe my merchandising strategy might be a little bit different or the impact an influencer has when they when they talk about the space. You know, we've had some amazing influencers come through the space. And, you know, that's another thing that we provide as support is that marketing support. So whether we're collaborating with their internal communication team or their PR team, we have an agency partner who's local to the area, who's also helping tag team, getting influencers coming, um, tag teaming, getting local media coverage, um, you know, and, and making sure that we're taking a holistic approach to what's going to best position this brand for success in a brick and mortar environment. Yeah, I love that. I love that it's, you know, an all encompassing strategy, essentially, like in this one partnership, you get all of these odds and ends that really help ensure success. So Ethan, you talked about how, you know, there's a founder story here tied to mm-hmm. Seattle. It's a big market for you guys. Um, what, what else were you hoping to accomplish with this pop up? Were you hoping that this would be an ideal testing space for further expansion? Um, Melissa hit on some some of the great objectives and, and you know, value props of, of going into pop ups. But what was top of mind for you? Well, quite frankly, a lot of things. Um, this whole setup process of what it takes to get a store layout designed, um, the amount of inventory we would need, everything related to like, what does it take to open a pop-up um, on the front half? I wanted to know about, right? Because we want to do plenty of these in the future. And I think it was going to be a great learning experience to figure out how many styles, what kind of styles, how do we visually merchandise it? Um, what I mean, among other things, like how do people, and I'd say probably one of the more important ones is once the doors are open, How do people shop for cuts in person, right? We've never seen that. And as I was kind of getting things ready for this, maybe a month before opening, I was like, holy cow, this is actually going to be really cool because I don't think any of us has ever considered what 500 shirts, our shirts looking like, would look like hanging up on racks in in a physical location. I mean, sure, we've seen them around like the office and whatnot, but actually seeing people get to like slide those hangers, I was like, wow, I'm actually really looking forward to that feeling or seeing that, right? And not just for like the, wow, this is awesome. Like, look at this huge step we've taken, but also for like, okay, I'm going to be watching their every move. Cause I want to see, I know exactly how these people shop for us online. We can follow their behavior and what pages they go to next, but I've never seen that in a retail setting or in a physical setting. So I'm just going to be like standing back, you know, kind of like, okay, so he went from there to there. Like what colors is he drawn to? Does it matter if he's drawn to this online, but people seem to go to this one first when they're in store. So there's so many different things that I was trying to connect the dots between um, the digital and the retail world to see how, our inventory, our, our shirts uh, perform, right? And um, so that was, I think, was one of the biggest things I was excited about. And also, I think we had this unique model I mentioned online, which is almost like shop by cut, where you can do the different collars and the different bottom hems. Was that going to relay or transmit the same way through the physical world, right? Would people be able to understand, you know, our offerings just from there? And, and so on top of that, I'd say that was probably the biggest one, but um, really just, you know, what the consumer what the consumer experience is for someone who'd never heard of cuts before and what they think when they walk into the store. Cause it's one thing, like I mentioned earlier to land on someone's Instagram account, get the vibe, get the feel, check the website, be like, okay, I like this. How can we make that? How can we replicate that for, for retail? Yeah. And Alicia, one thing I love what um, Ethan and the team did is we, we provide a turnkey fixture package and they really leaned into the opportunity of how to utilize that. Um, Not just from a merchandising standpoint, but from a storytelling standpoint and bringing in Mm. the powerful lifestyle imagery that you recently shot and using this as, you know, a point of this, this store is your story as much as it is a point of, you know, where you can make your purchase. Right. I think we, used every available fixture uh like signage moment possible so yeah it was cool it was really cool to see it all come together as well yeah i love that notion of you know seeing the brand come to life and identifying you know what what is translated seamlessly from digital to physical what's unique about it um like when you go into the store because i know myself personally i have inherently digital behaviors like i'll shop a certain way online it's usually more mission-based and i'm usually like intently searching for something but there's something about being in the store environment and you know having that more immersive experience like you're more 
likely to respond favorably to discovering something new or maybe going off of the shopping list and, you know, getting something you weren't um, initially planning to get. But there's also that experiential element in in the way of, you know, what new partnerships or or supporting products, um, you know, can come into this storytelling moment that, that you guys were talking about. And um, I love how brands can take a creative approach to those partnerships like is it an added service I know you guys did something special around Valentine's Day so what role did that kind of play in bringing you know your story to life your experience to life and you know what what kind of response did you get right well I mean I'll start off by saying um, we would have had a much bigger experiential activation if these weren't such trying times. I think a lot of the ideas we initially had were kind of shot down given the circumstances, but we worked within our bounds and um, we we had a few ideas. One of those being like, hey, like, you know, we're activating from end of January through the end of March. Valentine's Day fits right in the middle of there. Given what I just explained to you guys about the cuts guy and you know who he is, he's ambitious, but you know, we also occasionally on our, on our pages throw, uh, showcase imageries of guys and girls together. And because, you know, we want to like latch onto that, that couple, um, you know, idea and, and, and ethos and just very happy vibes. So, and also quite frankly, we get lots of girls purchasing cuts for their guys. You know, the second they see them wear the shirt, they're like, that's my favorite shirt. Like you need to buy more. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> we knew if we could bring the girls in and have them, you know, shop for the guys or at least you know encourage the guys to try this stuff on that it would help so essentially the activation was having a local florist come by and offer folks you know if they for every purchase of a shirt you can get a bouquet or you know a few roses um you know at various price points so it was just kind of like a little fun thing that that we were doing uh, for the days leading up to valentine's day where um, we combined a few things that are great guy gets a new shirt gets his lady a couple flowers everyone walks away happy you know mm-hmm. We also had a beverage partnership uh, in the That's early right. days of, of, of yeah. Doors Open, nice. too. I can definitely touch on all the other ones. Yeah, so we had um, uh, a local beverage coffee cart come through and provide very, very much free cappuccinos, lattes, matcha, whatever you'd like. Um, and it was great. I think people walked in. S- Seattle, I had never been for an extended period of time, but it definitely was getting kind of cold. So I think it was nice for people to walk in and you know enjoy a nice warm coffee while they're shopping and learning a little bit about the brand. Yeah, I love that. And I and I think those are small but impactful touches. And I think that's right. that's the one thing that I always try to emphasize or, or go back to when we think about store experience, right? Because it's very easy to get lost in the, you know, high touch, high tech stuff, which we'll we'll get into, make no mistake about that. But um Melissa, I would love your take on, you know, the, those little touches or like the elements that do play into a great experience and maybe how that's changing or, or being redefined now, especially because so many retailers I think are trying to focus on the fundamentals of branding, Ethan, like like you were talking about earlier, and are also trying to think, you know, how can we be thoughtful about the decisions that we make inside the store um, and, and be cognizant of budget and the manpower that goes into standing up these experiences, right? Like, I mean, wh- what's your take on those little those little touches that make an impact? For sure. I mean, I think that every touch point is an opportunity for connection. So I think what, you know, what we're kind of evolving from is there was this big push into just be safe, you know, and we have to be careful that these experiences don't be so safe that they're clinical. And then it just doesn't feel great to be there anymore, right? It still needs to be a positively emotional experience when you come in. So I think it's it's the opportunity to identify in those little moments, whether, you know, like you said, it's cold out, you can get a cup of coffee. I think a lot of hospitality aspects of retail are kind of stripped mm-hmm. away because we lean mm-hmm. so much into safety. Um, but it's it's all it's and it's those little adjacencies you might think of through partnerships that can make a big impact because every memory is a memory back to your store, you know, so whether it's the snack, whether it's the scent, whether it's the music you're playing, everything aligns with your brand at the end of the day mm-hmm. and every sensory element and connection you're making with your customer. So, you know, we might be a bit cautious when it comes to touch, but there's so many other senses there that you can really lean into. Even if it's in an environment where you might just be offering curbside pickup, for example, right? The message you put in the bag can be that moment of impact. You know, mm-hmm. everybody remembers a Snapple cap and you get that little 
you know, tip you didn't expect. And it was, you know, and if it's cool, people are going to share it on their socials too, right? So it's just still thinking that way. And it doesn't have to be huge moments. It has to be brand appropriate moments. It needs to be in your voice. Um, it needs to be consistent. But I think that people are craving that today even more than ever. So the more you can layer those in, uh, the more impact and the more memories that you're going to trigger for your customer when they think back, this happened. Oh, this happened at that store. Oh, I love that brand, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's excellent. So I, I did mention technology briefly, and it seems like, Ethan, you are very much laser focused on, you know, the brand story, the the visuals, the content, and, you know, there, there was really strong storytelling inside the store. Um, what role did technology play, if anything at all, in, in the store environment? Um, what, what thought process did you go through to determine that role? Because, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I think there's been a shift in discussion around the role of technology and not so much, you know, how do we make this like super high touch and high tech, but it's more intentional. It's more thoughtful and driven by goals. Like what do we want our audience to accomplish? What, what can we do to make the experience better? So, I mean, what does that, what did that look like for cuts for, for the store experience? Yeah. So with regards to technology, our store wasn't super tech heavy, uh, to any degree. I mean, the two main areas that come to mind, at least on the consumer facing side are, we had a big sizzle, a big television that sits behind the cash wrap with a sizzle reel we made. And we took some of our best, uh, content based video or video content and kind of made it, I don't know, a three and a half, four minute um, looping thing with our logo at the end that just kind of right when you walk in and actually, to be honest, probably about 200 yards outside the door through the big glass windows, you can see that TV playing even at night. So it, was really eye-catching and definitely gave a great representation of what our brand was and just kind of the imagery and the type of high quality content that we we produce we have a a saying that we say here you know if it's not world-class content we're not going to put it out there um so we felt that really got to give off a little bit of the brand um you know in a more visual engaging format outside of the the still signage that we had and the other one would be how incredibly useful the Shopify point of sale system was. I think uh, that Shopify is what we use to to complete orders and, and, and run our e-commerce website online. And they offer an in-store point of sale system, right? So it links directly with our store. We're able to manage inventory through there. We're able to see, even while I'm back in Los Angeles right now, who's purchasing from the store, what inventory levels are looking like. Um, it'll pull up the previous customer's excuse me, the customer that's in store, it'll pull up their email address and say, oh, hey, they've shopped with you online. So really connecting the, the digital and the retail, um, I guess, worlds uh, with regards to the, our customers, uh, that made it super simple. And then on the back end, right, we're able to look at just tons of this data and, and see once this is all over, you know, what units moved the best? Did it compare similarly to what we see online? Uh, are people buying more long sleeves than short sleeves? Like any single thing that we would want to dive into, we're able to see was the average order value a little bit more in store because someone got to touch the fabric and feel it and be like, oh, wow, this is, you know, definitely worthwhile. Or, you know, how do those things differ? So I would say, you know, from the actual storefront premise, not terribly tech heavy, right? We don't necessarily need to be. We, we're, we're, we're a shirt brand. I mean, one day I would love to get maybe some VR experience in there, but I haven't thought that far yet. Um, but other than that, I mean, it, it's still lots of technology happening on the back end, lots of digital marketing techniques that we're able to use and to, to really kind of bring that data into what we already know for our digital marketing initiatives and see how it worked in retail. Yeah, I think that integration is so important. And, and like Melissa mentioned earlier, that halo effect and and understanding, okay, you know, who's within this specific area, who visited, who came to the store, maybe purchased something online. I mean, you can't uncover that insight without having that integration and i mean you don't have to go too deep into like performance i know there's still a bit more time you know for your store but have you uncovered any learnings or any key trends around you know how people are interacting with the store engaging with the store and ultimately what that ripple effect is you know to your digital properties well not necessarily in that regard however i have found that one area and I'm just going to mention one of the, the, the oversights on my behalf. So uh, that's okay, though. Uh, one of the things I found as people were shopping through the store was that 
I, and I wanted to create this, but little signage pieces that kind of outlined, hey, this rack is our curve hems, this rack is our, our split hems, this rack over here is our elongated, to kind of really clearly differentiate which was on which rack. On our website, you can go to shop shirts and then select right there, right? So people know exactly what they're looking for. But in the physical presence, um, we opted not to do that because I still wanted to, you know, keep it somewhat clean, crisp, um, not a lot of distraction in the store outside of, you know, our, our, our product and, and our signage. However, I think for educational purposes, I probably would have done something like that because um, in the digital side, you know, we can see, hey, well, 85% of people go directly to our curve hem page um, right when they land on the, on, the, on the homepage. What does that look like in store? You can't really glean some of those insights, but I did come across a few instances where I was like, wow, I really kind of wish I put some some nice branded signage, not not you know, over the top aggressive, like, you know, doesn't something that doesn't fit in the store, like, hey, here's the curve hems, here's this, but something that, you know, added complemented to it would have been nice to have. So that's one of the main things I would I would consider uh, something that could have been done a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate your transparency there, because sure. I feel like yeah. a lot of the times, you know, part of the value is in testing and learning and seeing, right. you know, what resonates. And, you know, to, to your point, what should be you know, copy and paste it for lack of a better word between mm -hmm. digital and physical and what needs to be completely unique. So I, I, com right. I completely appreciate your transparency there. I mean, yeah, is there worries. anything else that, that you've learned in the process? I mean, I know it's an ongoing iterative process, I'm sure, but um, anything else that you think would be helpful for the folks listening right now? I guess one thing that was incredibly important that I honestly think we kind of nailed, which I'm happy about, was the back of house organization system when it comes to inventory. And I keep mentioning, you know, our products and how we can have one black shirt, but then it's got different color options and different bottom hem options and different sizes. So when I was thinking about it before we got into the store, I was like, oh man, this is going to give me a headache. Like, how are we going to like do this? Because I wanted it to essentially be a showroom at first where people would come in, they would like a shirt and then they could go back and, and someone from one of the employees would be able to go back and grab it. Because we have these really beautiful, like matte, nice uh, bags that they come in. And I feel like that's part of the experience, you know, being handed that bag. We opted not to go that route, but you know what I'm getting at is having a super organized back of house inventory system. I can't, um, I, I can't overestimate that at all, um, or at least you know exemplify how important it is. Um, that's probably one of the big learnings. But other than that, I think a lot of things went right, and I'm not going to say it's from 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 skill or or experience. I think it was a little bit of dumb luck and a little bit of like a good team working together to just think about every single angle that we could before we went into the store. And of course, the help of Lionesque, Drive 21, Fury, Periodic, mm -hmm. like, I, honestly, I don't know how I haven't said that yet, but could not have done it without them and all their all their amazing advice throughout the entire experience. Love that. Yeah, and, I, and it's been I, good to have a collaborative effort towards it, you know, and all the all the parties coming together and really leaning into each other's expertise. I think right and that 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 is definitely right. a goal of periodic is, is to be able to do that right doesn't matter the size of the company you're at let's give you the tools as if you were mm -hmm. a big organization coming into physical retail and we have that marketing support the signage support the fixturing package the operational strategy conversation um, right and and when when you talk about signage i think that was a great thing to bring up because there is a lot of conversation around that always like how much does when we think of customer journey in store how much do we mirror those decision trees that we know of from online, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what you brought up is a great thing that could be infused in the future. And like you said, it's not a heavy lift, right? It's just thinking through right. it, like what are the decision trees and how do we help that navigation become as fluid as possible in store? And then the right. other thing I just want to add is, you know, one other thing we talk a lot about with Periodic too is the staff is like one of your most powerful points of contact in store. And so there's these learnings that happen, like you said, through the back end of Shopify. And, and I think Shopify is powerful, but it's the contextualization of those learnings that you get from the staff too, that become invaluable for a brand, mm -hmm. because you might get insights that a certain cut or a certain color, or a certain hem is moving, but it's the mm -hmm. staff that can tell you on a daily basis, here's why and why not. And if mm -hmm. those are invaluable learnings, I think, as you're thinking of design and merchandising and, and, and approach going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a really strong point. So so with that, Ethan, I'm mm -hmm. sure you and your team are, are still thinking about what's what's next, right? You're planning for, you know, the next few weeks, months, quarters. I mean, 
planning strategies may be a little bit different for retailers today, just with everything yeah. changing so rapidly. But you know, what's what's next? What's top of the agenda for for cuts right now? Uh, regarding the pop up or, or in, in general? yeah, re regarding your store strategy or sure. or just expanding the brand. I mean, what what's what's the top of the priority list for you? Right. So, I mean, on the short term, we really wanted to get some, we have, like I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of athlete relationships from guys on almost every single team, including the Seattle Seahawks. We really wanted to get some of those guys in the stores, but unfortunately, you know, I, I keep mentioning this, but the times we weren't able to, to make that happen. They, they were put on some pretty strict regulations with where they can and can't go when they're not practicing or, or at games and whatnot. And even though the season's over, it's still, and we thought those were, those were going to lift a little bit. Um, that was one of the big things we, we had planned for um, in the month of March. It was like, hey, let's get a couple of the top guys from the Seahawks to come out and maybe do a little activation. So unfortunately, that didn't uh, wasn't able to come to fruition. However, we, we do have plans for a handful of more influencer visits uh, here in the short term uh, before we, we head out of the store. And then for the long term, honestly, it's been such a good experience for us. And with things hopefully looking like they're starting to open back up, I mean, depending, like I'm talking November, December, we've talked internally about possibly doing this again with periodic in the same location because we know how if, if it's available you know i don't want to like you know try and snag it before anyone else can can have their fair game but we know just the the location of where this storefront is in seattle and being right in the heart of all those those amazon buildings and the amount of foot traffic that that place probably typically garners in a in a in a normal world would be incredibly invaluable to us to at least you know, we, we would want to try that again with with that the amount of people there. And um, so, you know, November, December has historically been our biggest times of year online, simply just because gifting and whatnot. But not to mention, we sell long sleeves and we have hoodies now and whatnot. So colder months, we're, we're still there. But I think um, that's probably the biggest initiative is like, hey, should we try this again? But like now that we've kind of got it dialed in a little bit more, let's do it with things are open back up and, you know, in our, our biggest shopping period time. Um, but I, I I think that's something that you know we'll have to talk about, but it's definitely been in more than a few discussions. That's great, super exciting stuff. We'll definitely keep an eye on that. And, and Melissa, I mean, how about your team? How about everything that's happening with Periodic? Because I, I could imagine over um, you know the course of these last few months, all of the great partnerships you've had, um, a lot of different applications, a lot of different learnings, and you already have such a. a, a hearty um, mix of services, benefits, capabilities that kind of come into this partnership. But any um, any insight into, you know, how the periodic model or offering may expand or or evolve moving forward or, or just, you know, any sort of forward looking priorities, I mean, for for your team, because this is such a evolving and, and still, you know, continually exciting space right now for retail. For sure. You know, as, as Ethan mentioned, it's been really great to see so many positive activations happen, even though, you know, we have uh, capacity limitations and other hurdles. So it's very encouraging of what the possibilities are going to be when those restrictions lift and people start coming out and, you know, we really can see that foot traffic again. So we're excited for that evolution. There's a whole event strategy that we want to empower brands to layer in on top of this. So that's that's those are the icing layers that we look forward mm -hmm. to be to bring in. And, you know, it's a holistic approach of programming, right? Like what else is happening in the neighborhood? Is it wellness month? Whatever it is, you know, how do you how do you insert periodic into that conversation? So those are some of the things we look forward to as far as our relationships with the brands. You know, this is one location and, you know, our focus is building human connection and, and physical spaces. So being able to stay on as, as partners and have relationships with brands, even when they leave periodic and they look at brick and mortar footprints around the country, you know, is a relationship we want to be able to keep. Um, but then we also see the opportunity for periodic to exist beyond Seattle. So, um, you know, again, as as we got more clarity of what's happening nationwide, we will be able to kind of pinpoint a little bit more closely where, where that makes the most sense. Um, but that is a hope um, and a plan going forward that this is only the first location. So exciting. Both of you have such amazing things coming down the pipeline. So definitely a lot to follow up on. 
hopefully. Um, really appreciate you both taking the time out to talk about this partnership, um, the experience, the findings thus far. Um, I think you both said it really nicely that, you know, community is incredibly valuable, um, especially now when everyone is testing new things, pushing limits, and um, everyone kind of has their unique perspectives, their, their unique um, you know, knowledge base that they that everyone can kind of tap into, share stories, share experiences, share learnings. Um, so to see it in action is really enlightening and, and really inspiring. But before I let you both go, um, I do want to ask this kind of close the loop. You know, where where is the 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 pop up trend going? Because I know on our side, we've been covering, of course, new new applications that reaffirm the benefits of pop-ups, right? Like Melissa, you were saying, testing new products, partnerships, um, you know, product launches even, um, we've seen and covered. Um, but of course, the real estate market is kind of in this space right now where, you know, brands and retailers are looking to short-term lease options. Um, you know, there there is the need for a bit more flexibility and agility in uh, store investments. Um, mm -hmm. So Ethan, maybe start with you first. I mean. Where do you think this space is going? What are you excited about? What are you keeping an eye on as, you know, the the director of brand for Cuts? I love this question, particularly because <laughs> particularly because there are still so many naysayers out there or perhaps in addition to naysayers, I would say there's so many um, people think, like scratching their heads and saying like, really, like retail? Mm -hmm. um, and your question kind of perfectly sums it up. Uh, we kind of entering, we're entering this period where D to C has been around for, you know, give or take since 2012, 2013 is when it really started popping off. I was in another company before this, that was a, a quick rise to fame, um, direct to consumer brand. And, and after that, you know, the question became like, are we only going to sell online? And it's like, and retail over here is slowly, I don't want to say dying, like big, big brick and mortar stores are like closing their doors left and right. But that's because that's the old model and D2C is the new model, but that doesn't mean retail goes anywhere. It just has to be experiential. It has to be welcoming. It has to be more activation based. It has to be more something that you walk into. And like Melissa touched on earlier, you walk out of that with a feeling and that's part of your brand story. The same way that the content that I post on our Instagram resonates with someone in a certain way. When they walk into our store, they feel a certain way. So I, I live in, in Los Angeles. I'm regularly driving down Abbott Kinney Boulevard in Venice and there's stores like Everlane that now have shops or Warby Parker. And these are all companies that are initially started online. Right? So I think in terms of the short term, short term rental, I think it's probably, and I'm not just saying this, it's probably where things are headed and what's where I want them to head. Like, do we need a year round storefront open? No. Can we probably get the same thing accomplished in like a two month span and have a few of those trickled throughout the United States or perhaps the world throughout the year. Absolutely. Because if you give people an enclosed time frame that they have to visit something, not only I think is it kind of get them in gear and be like, Oh, I want to go check out the store. I'm going to go, but it feels more of an exclusive um, experience that, you know, you are part of during that moment in time. And I think as long as you make each one unique and you make each uh, storefront and activation something that people will remem remember and latch onto and, and kind of take your brand up a notch in their brain, um, that's what people are after now. I mean, you see it, it's the last point I'll make, you'll see it in movie theaters. Movie theaters people don't really go to anymore, but they've changed their model now. So it's fewer seats, they recline, they're massive, they're comfortable, they deliver you food, they bring you wine. It's, a good, it's the same concept, but it's just tweaked a little bit to meet what the modern person wants. And so I think retail is exactly kind of what Periodic, Lionesque, and, and the entire team are doing. It's, it was so turnkey and so seamless outside of just a little bit of hard work that, you know, it's definitely something that we're going to be pursuing again. And I'm hoping there are more locations, right? Because, you know, I don't want to ask where they're going to be, but I would love to do some <laughs> in, in some other um, cities and states. Love it. Yeah, well, so you're probably talking about this all the time. <laughs> yeah, and I love that you bring up the movie theater because the interesting thing about that too is people are also willing to pay more. Like I'd never mm -hmm. paid more right. to see a movie, <laughs> but you'll do it if it's the right experience, right? So mm -hmm. that wasn't the friction before. It wasn't the cost of the ticket. It was that this became a better experience. So right. Um, right. I definitely believe in, in pop-up, not because, you know, we've specialized in that because we work across, you know, all formats, but um, the purpose that it serves continues to evolve and, you know, out of the gate, it's going to be a good solve for the uncertainty, right? And, and making sure that 
we can test and iterate like what does the store experience need to look like and but you're always going to have brands that have seasonality and even even mass market brands that might have a national footprint as they're relooking at their capital expenditures you already saw them kind of start to decide okay here are top performers here are some that really doesn't make sense for us to have a presence 12 months a year but we still need to show up at certain times of the year whether like you said seasonality a new product launch a partnership you're testing new technology maybe that you're unveiling in store there's so many things that it could solve for and then of course that sense of urgency that it creates when it's a limited time, you know, you get to have this amazing, um, very vocal focus group too come because people enter a pop up with usually a different mindset than a store that they expect to be there 12 months a year. They inherently have in their head, I'm going to discover something today. And so it, it's such an opportunity to be able to harness that. Um, so I don't think it's going away. I think it's a mainstay. I think it's as brands evaluate different store formats. This is a format that they they keep on that list. And, you know, some markets are going to be flagship, some are going to be pop up, some are going to be small format service based. And so I think you're going to continue to see that variety. Love that. A very inspiring and positive note, I think, to close on, which is um, very refreshing with all of the um, changes and uncertainties that have um, continued to emerge in light of everything. So Ethan, very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Melissa, always a pleasure. Loved hearing all about this partnership and wishing you both much success and and positivity as we continue forward uh, through 2021. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. And as always, everyone out there watching, thank you so much for taking the time out. If you have any questions for us, uh, Melissa or Ethan, drop us a line on social media. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, continue that conversation. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.